Hello, welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner. We're covering Sergey Lang's basic mathematics. And if you've been following this series up to chapter 13, I would say that you're ready for more advanced mathematics. You're ready for calculus. You should be able to understand all the basic concepts. Everything from here on out is a very light touching of much more advanced math concepts that go way beyond calculus. So uh, this stuff you can handle. And if you have a future in physics or mathematics, I highly encourage you to follow along with me through the final few chapters here. Uh, the last chapter, obviously, I think is 17, um, which 17 does determinants. And there is a chapter, uh, let me just flip through the book here really quick. We have chapter 16 on induction and summations. That's gonna really help you get ready for calculus. And then we have the complex plane in chapter 15, complex numbers squared to negative one, that kind of stuff in chapter 15. So 14 is mappings. And um, if you were looking at this book at the table of contents um, and you're still struggling with algebra and geometry, and, and so you're, you're approaching this book as a student and, and, and you look at the chapter headings and you say mappings in chapter 14, you're like, what in the world is mappings? And why is that even important? Well, we've just covered functions in the last chapter. And so mappings is actually a more general concept of the function concept we just explored. And so in mappings, we're going to take this concept of a function and really build upon it and just start to put into place some things that are going to be really awesome as you get closer and closer to more advanced mathematics. So let's start with the definition. So his definition of a mapping is excuse me, similar to the definition of a function. So a function is an association. Excuse me. What a function does is it takes a number and it maps it to another number. And the function itself isn't the expression that x equals to, or that, that you use to get the function at that point, it's the mapping. It's the association between these points to those points. And nowadays we call this the domain and we call this the range or rather all possible x that can be inputs is a domain and all possible f of x that could be outputs is the range, okay? So he notes that um, we have seen functions that are not defined for all numbers. For instance, if we had the mapping x goes to x squared, then the range can only have positive values, right? If x is a real number, you can use any real number you want for the domain, but the range can only have positive numbers or zero, okay? And so a mapping is a general idea where you have two sets. He calls them S and S prime, okay? S is gonna be the domain, S prime is gonna be the range. And a mapping takes the general concept that you will take elements of the set S and map them into elements of the set S prime, okay? You may have a rule or you may have a formula, you may have just a general concept of what you wanna do, right? All right. So we call this number that comes out. So if we take some element of S, let's call it X, and then we map it into the mapping of, of X through F, we're gonna call this the value, the mapping F at X, or we might call it the image of X under F. Okay. So we're taking an X from this set, something's happening to it, and then we get an element of this other S prime set, and that other element is called the value of mapping of F at X, or the image of X under F, okay? Functions, he calls functions a special case where functions take um, and render something into the real number set, right? So this can be points, this can be anything, but so far we've only looked at functions um, where we take real numbers to real numbers. That's in the last chapter. But you could think of functions that take points and convert them to real numbers. Let's, let's get an example of a mapping here. Let P equals one, two. So P is equal to the point one, two. And we have another point A is equal to minus three, five. So P and A are both in um, the real R2 set, right? So they're both in R2, right? The points in the plane. Then there's an association where you take T and you map that to P plus TA, okay? And T 
is a real number. So t is in the real number set, right? And so this is the parameterized form of a line, if you recall from previous chapters on that, okay? And so we can also rewrite this as this is the point one or minus three t and then two plus five t. Okay, so that's one minus three t, two plus five t, okay? We have another mapping that we can create. This one's kind of interesting, right? So we're gonna take some real number theta. So theta is an R. And we're gonna map that to points in R2 given by the coordinates cosine of theta and sine of theta. So theta can be any real number and we're gonna map to these points here. And you might recognize this as a circle. So this shape, the points that come out here are gonna form a circle, okay? Centered on the origin, radius one. If we take a subset of the mapping, so we say T is a subset of S, okay? And we say that the set of all values, so T is in T, so we take T map to F of T, okay? So obviously F of T has to be an S prime or whatever the mapping we're using. Then this is called the image of T, or all the points T is called the image of T under F. Okay, so going back to the example of the circle, the image of all of the real numbers, theta, produces a circle, right, under this mapping, this, Im this function or mapping, whatever you want to call it, okay? And another example he gives is, let's suppose that we had uh, x, where x is a real number, being mapped to the coordinates x, comma, x squared. What would the image of this look like? And this would be a parabola, right? So the image of this would be a parabola. Centered on the origin, it's two stems facing up. So it's gonna look like this, like that. Okay, and this one is a circle. Let's use a purple to draw the circle. Purple circles are the best. So this is a circle, right? Okay. A, B are positive integers, positive. So they're greater than zero and they're numbers. They, they could be integers, they could be reals. And then we have a mapping, we're gonna call it F of A comma B which maps real numbers in the pl or plane, in the points in the plane to points in the plane, such that the point in the plane P will go to, uh, let's, let's do it this way instead. Let's say X comma Y will go to A X comma B Y. Okay, so that's what this mapping does, is it takes points X comma Y and it converts it into points with A times X and B times Y. And you might recognize this as a stretching along the x-coordinate axis and a stretching along the y-coordinate axis. And so if we were to take the circle that we got here and put it through this mapping, we would get an ellipse out of that, okay? That's what this mapping would do, okay? Let's look at another mapping. This mapping, what we're doing is we are taking, let's take this color here. So let's consider the mapping F that takes real numbers and maps them to points in the plane, okay? And we're gonna define the point, the mapping to be such that f of t is equal to t squared comma, comma t cubed, okay? So it's not immediately obvious what this will form, but we can rewrite this as x of t is equal to t squared and y of t is equal to t cubed. So we can also rewrite this as x of t comma y of t. And if you're doing first year physics, calculus based, you're gonna be very familiar with this style of thinking, okay? So let's draw what that's gonna look like. So at t equals zero, the x and the y is gonna be zero, zero. At t equals one, x is gonna be one, y is gonna be one. At t equals two, x is going to be t squared, which is four, and y is gonna be t cubed, which is eight. At t equals three, t squared is going to be nine and t cubed is gonna be 27. And if we do negatives, so negative one, t squared is gonna be one, t cubed is minus one. Minus two, we're gonna get four and minus eight. And then minus three, we're going to get nine and minus 27. Okay, so let's map this out really quick. 
So at t equals 0, we get 0 comma 0. At t equals 1, we get 1 comma 1. At t equals 2, we get 4 comma 8. And at t equals 3, we get 3 comma 27. So it's going to be like way up there. And at t equals minus 1, we get 1 comma minus 1. At t equals minus 2, we're going to get 4 comma minus 8. So it's going to be mirrored along that x-axis. So what this is going to look like is like half of a parabola or something shaped like that. And it's going to be going like that. Okay. And as t increases, we're going to be moving this direction. So as we go from large negative numbers up to 0, we're going to reach that point and then inflect. And then we're going to go up back towards infinity. Let's do a little physics problem here, a precursor of things to come if you're going to study physics with me. We are going to have a stone thrown from a tall building in the horizontal direction. Gravity pulls the stone down. We want to give the coordinates x of t, comma y of t, of the stone as a function of time t. Okay? So if the building is 50 feet tall, okay, then x of t x is the horizontal component. So there's no horizontal forces acting. So we're going to have some constant c. That's how, far, how fast the stone was thrown in the horizontal direction initially. And it's going to maintain that speed. We're not taking into account resistance or anything like that. Um, the y coordinate, however, it is going to start at 50. And then as, it's, as time goes on, it's going to fall with the formula 1 half gt squared. Okay? And so we can map every point in time from t goes to ct comma 50 minus 1 half g t squared. So we're working in units of feet and we're working in units of seconds for time. Okay. At some point t0, um, f the x, the y coordinate of t0 is going to equal 0 and at that point it doesn't make any sense to continue. So t is less than or equal to zero, is greater than or equal to zero, and is less than or equal to t zero. So we can only go between the time range of zero up to t zero when the stone hits the ground. Okay? So we can calculate t zero by setting this to zero and that to t zero. So we get zero is equal to 50 minus one half g times t zero squared. Okay? And moving some terms around, we're gonna move this to the right side. So we get one half g t naught squared is equal to 50. Uh, multiply both sides by 2 and divide by g, so we get t0 squared is equal to 100 divided by g, and we take the square root of both sides, t0 is equal to the square root of 100 over g, and if we use uh, 32, I believe, is what he uses for g, yeah, g is equal to 32, okay, 32 feet per second squared, so then that is going to give us a square root of 100 divided by 32. Okay, and you can simplify that if you really wanted to divide, you know, by four in the top and the bottom, so we get 25 over eight. But at this point, if you really wanted the number, you'd plug it into the calculator. Okay, so that is how you can use this process to figure out how a stone behaves when it's thrown from a window. So congratulations, this is kind of your first step in physics here. Um, in a good introductory physics course, they're going to really go deep into this, and they're going to have hundreds of problems that you can practice so that you really can get this concept beaten into your head. Okay? Let's take another example. In this example, we're going to let the input, the domain, set S, is going to equal points in the plane R squared. Right? It's going to be inside of the points in the plane. Okay? And then we have the association, we take points x from r squared, and we're going to map them to the distance between x and the origin. Okay? And obviously this, so the s prime is going to be real numbers, because distance is measured with a number, not a point. Okay? And he calls this a function. Right? This is the distance function, and you can call this d or whatever you want to call. Okay? So we could have another formula, let's say d, a p, would be x will map the distance between x and that point p. So you can have another function like that too. It's not terribly difficult. Uh, the mapping here. So this point, we're going to start with points in the plane. So we have x, y maps to, we're going to take the x squared, and we're going to add cosine of x times y. Okay. So here again, the set that we're mapping into is just real numbers. Okay. So he calls this again a function, 
um, it's defined on R squared because the input points are points in the plane, the output is real numbers, right? So the domain would be points in the plane, the range would be real numbers, okay? Um, another example, given at a given time t, we let f of t be the temperature of a certain body, then f is a function of time. So uh, we can describe temperature this way, and I do intend to do thermal physics, the actual stuff. So over time t, we can define the temperature as some function f of t, which just takes real numbers. So on this side, we have real numbers, and we're mapping to real numbers, okay? Exercises. Um, these exercises, I think he, he put a lot of work into them, and they're pretty interesting. Um, go ahead and have fun with them. I don't see any that are particularly complicated. I don't see any new concepts introduced in the exercises. This is more just more practice to kind of reinforce these concepts into your head and get you used to his terminology the way that he describes things. With that, I'm going to wrap this video up. If you guys have any questions, be sure to ask. I would love to help clear up any misconceptions or or if you have any questions about, you know, concepts that this might be related to. Anyway, guys, have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. This video is part of a series on the theory of Python. You can click on the left to see the playlist and on the right to support my channel. Thank you very much for your time.